Welcome again to Arizona Conference Virtual Camp Meeting 2021. We are so glad we have all of you here in our local venue, as well as those who are watching online on Good News TV and uh, YouTube and Facebook. We are truly thankful for you being here. I have to tell you, we're getting comments from all over. I forgot to mention one this morning because one of our, our helpers is the pastor of the Tucson Sharon Church, Jonathan Smith, Dr. Jonathan Smith. And one of his members texted earlier today, or I shouldn't say texted, chatted earlier today that they're excited about what's happening at Arizona Camp Meeting and they're participating as well. We are truly grateful for what God is doing. It has been a real blessing, and we're looking forward to this final installment. I want to say one quick shout-out again to Pat Francis Howard. She's done a wonderful job with our lead-in music. And when I say that, I say it thinking about my dear friend Phil Draper. If Phil was here, he would be getting lots of shout-outs. He has done so much for Arizona Conference Camp Meeting for so many years. We truly miss him. Wish maybe we could get him to videotape a song or something for us. We miss our dear friend Phil. But uh, leads us into our, our tonight, and uh, we just want to ask God to bless us in a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, bless us tonight. As uh, Dr. Dan opens the word for us again, as your musicians sing and bring us close to heaven again, Lord, we just pray that our hearts would be open to doing whatever you would want us to do. Lord, motivate us to serve you better through this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll start now by singing our theme song, Faith is the Victory, and we'll sing two stanzas. I'd 
rather have Jesus more than anything this world affords today. Oh, I'd rather have Jesus more than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause, and I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. Oh, I'd rather be true to his holy name. I'm Pastor Ed Anderson here in Phoenix, Arizona, the Arizona Conference. We're doing a baptism. It's historical, the very first time here on the Salt River. We have 35 baptisms and the Holy Spirit is working. The latter rain is occurring. Jesus is coming soon. Today we're going to have it happen with our conference president, Ed Keyes, our ministerial secretary, Jorge Ramirez, and myself. So we are so thankful that, that this is happening today and we just have to say praise Lord. What a special event to have these individuals, both young and old, say yes to Jesus. They want to follow Jesus with all their heart. I want to tell you, whoever's listening at home, whoever's watching this, that is the best decision you can make. We thank the Lord for the Chandler English Church and the Chandler Phil Am Church that joined together today for this special event. God bless you, God keep you, and keep you safe. I decided to get baptized because I I wanted to do it now and stuff later. I was thinking of doing it next year. And I know that I love the Holy Spirit and that He loves me. Amen. what just happened here you know the Bible says that in the last days the Holy Spirit will rain down and we know that Jesus is coming soon and today we had 33 baptisms but five others came from the crowd and said we want to be baptized 
I believe that Jesus is coming soon and the Holy Spirit is working on people. People just need the opportunity to give their decisions to Jesus. And this message goes out to everybody watching this video now. Get your life right with God because Jesus is coming soon. And all you have to believe is in Jesus dying for you and taking Jesus into your heart and saying, Lord, I want to have a life in heaven. And I thank you for giving the sacrifice on the cross for me. So be a part of this movement. Jesus is coming soon in these last days. This baptism today out here on the Salt River in Arizona is evidence that we're near the end. Amen. What a special event that was. We were truly excited to be there. It's always, it's always neat to see people baptized. I can tell you I've done, I've done well over 100 weddings in my ministerial career. I've done, uh, unfortunately, dozens of funerals. I've done a lot of communion services, baby dedications, even house dedications. We even dedicated a, a van when I was in the Philippines some years ago to, to God's work. But there is nothing like a baptism. And, and thank you, Scott Michael Bennett, for sharing that. There is nothing like seeing someone make that decision to follow Jesus. It was a fun event. And I've been trying to be as close to scripted as possible since we're on live. But I do have to tell you this. I couldn't help, I can't help but to tell you this. When we were there, I asked my beautiful wife, I said, do you think I should go with my robe on or should I go down to the tent they have down by the river? And I'll just get changed in the tent. And she goes, well, maybe go down by the tent. And I thought about it. I said, well, I don't want to drag clothes around. I'll put my robe on now. So I put my robe and my sandals on, and I started walking through the parking lot with all these people who are going rafting and canoeing and everything else. And people would point at me, and they'd say, Moses? Or they'd say, Jesus? And they put this tall guy with sandals and a white robe. And the funniest one, though, was one guy pointing are you, what are you doing here today? I said, well, we're having a baptism. He goes, there's a lot of people here need to be baptized. <laughs> it was just an incredible, incredible event. And God, I agree with Pastor Anderson, God is doing something special here. I don't, time does not give us or permit us to share all that's going on, but I know my right-hand guy, Elder Ramirez, can tell you of all the baptisms that are happening in various churches all around Arizona uh, in the most recent months. It's been amazing what God is doing, even during a pandemic. Nothing can stop God. Amen? Now, it's my privilege tonight to give a couple of special gifts, as we typically do in Arizona, give gifts besides other gifts uh, to our uh, musicians and our speaker. And so I'd like to ask Scott Michael Bennett if you'd come forward for a second, my friend. I know you're going to be singing in a minute, but this is a special gift. There's only about 300 people in the world that have one of these, and they've all either sang or spoke for the Arizona Conference. <laughs> and this is a special, special cactus. We love the little stand that it comes on, and it says Arizona, and when you're home playing with your kids or talking to your wife, and you see that, say, hey, I had a fun time in Arizona, and God bless. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You. God bless you. And now I'm going to... Yes, we can praise the Lord for his ministry. I'm going to ask Dr. Dan Girard to come up as well. He calls himself Danny. I like that since he's a baseball player. There's a lot of good Danny baseball players. I won't get into that. But Dan, thank you again for your tremendous ministry. And in this bag that my wife is holding is one of these cactus for you as well. Praise the Lord. And we want to thank you for what you've done. You've brought us close to Jesus. I'm going to give a shout out to a pastor here in Arizona, retired not too long ago, a guy named a Rocky Gale, who texted me today and said he's never been so touched by a message than the message you gave him. Rocky's an evangelist. He's a soul winner. Praise so God. praise the Lord. Thank Amen. you, Doc, Dr. Dan. God bless you. Thank you, Thank you. Oh, it's in the back. 
Thank you very much. Dan, watch this one. This is our, this is our sample one. You, this is like getting the sample car. You want the original. All right. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Scott, for your music ministry that you are sharing with us during this camp meeting. I followed Brother Scott for some time on Facebook, but it's good to be with him in person. He is a man after my own heart. I want you to know how much this camp meeting experience has meant to me. I am leaving this place a better man than when I came. Better because of my experience with the Lord here and my fellowship with you. You are my kind of people. I believe I've held seven revivals in different churches in Arizona, so I almost feel like an adopted uh, resident here. I ask for you to continue to pray for my wife and myself as we travel, lifting up the Lord. My wife is a nurse, and she's retired. And her expertise is dementia and Alzheimer's. She's written a book on Alzheimer's. Uh, she speaks at uh, churches, civic events, uh, medical groups, and has a terrific ministry uh, dealing with those. She also is a volunteer with hospice. She would like to have been here with me, 
But just a couple of days after I return home, she's going to North Carolina, uh, driving by herself to visit with her family. So she felt like this much traveling was just not suitable for her. But I'm sure that when she does come to meet you, she will fall in love with you just like I have. This evening, I'm going to share with you how we can be an overcomer through continual praise. Would you bow your hearts together with me in prayer? Father, we pause to thank you for what we have experienced with you and with one another during this camp meeting setting. We thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit has graced us with your presence as we have assembled together. And Lord, I pray that if I have said anything or I have done anything while in this place that has not been becoming to you, has not represented you in the way that I should have, please forgive me. And now realizing the importance of what I'm about to share from your word, again, I'm offering myself as a vessel, a fresh and anew into your hands. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight so that your purpose, your design purpose might be accomplished for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective. Because this prayer I pray and praises for victories I give in Christ's name, amen. Don't raise your hands, but despite maintaining good devotional habits relative to prayer, as we looked at in our earlier session, have you ever felt as though you were never quite satisfied with your spiritual journey, with your walk with the Lord? I must confess that I have. And I've asked myself, and I've asked others, and I've had others ask me the question, why? Why is it that sometimes we get on this roller coaster spiritual experience, and, and sometimes we're up and sometimes we're down? Why is it that, that these kind of frustrations plague us as part of Heavenly Father's family? And I believe there are many answers to that question. But I'm convicted in my intellect, and I'm convinced in my emotions, that one of the answers relates to an aspect of worship and of daily living that we do not exercise enough. Now, I believe in exercise. I am a certified master fitness trainer. I religiously work out at least four days a week. I've trained hundreds of people down through the years. I've had my own fitness business. I've written a book on fitness. So I believe in personal fitness. I believe in physical fitness. But even more than that, I believe in spiritual fitness. And one of the aspects of spiritual fitness that we do not exercise enough is in regard to praise. A number of years ago, I was traveling and I read a slogan on a church sign that went like this. Praise is the spark plug of faith. Amen. And I like that. Amen. You know what a spark plug does, don't you? It helps bring about ignition. And sometimes our faith needs igniting. Do you remember that the disciples came to Jesus on one occasion and asked a favor of him concerning faith? They said, Lord, increase our faith. And the Bible teaches that you and I are to be growing. We are to be maturing in our faith. And to the student of God's word, it's quite convincing that the Bible places just as important emphasis on praise as it does on prayer. And in our journey with Christ, there must be the balance of both of them. There must be prayer and there must be praise. When I was a young boy, we were visiting our grandparents one Sunday afternoon and I was walking out across their backyard and I saw some dust coming from beneath one of the large trees. And being the inquisitive young man I was then and still am today, I made my way to the tree to investigate 
And when I arrived, I saw laying on the ground a small little bird. It had fallen from its nest and broken one of its wings. And with its one good wing, it was flapping with all of its might, all of its strength, all of its energy. And yet the little bird was just going round and round and round in a circle, stirring up a lot of dust. And I thought about that little bird many times since becoming a Christian. Isn't that how we sometimes find ourselves? Despite a lot of programs and, and movement, it seems as though sometimes as individuals and families and churches, we're just going round and round and round in a circle, stirring up a lot of dust. Well, if you and I are going to be overcomers at God desires, we need two whole wings. We need the wing of prayer and we need the wing of praise. Because as these two wings are in proper functioning order, you and I can mount up above the circumstances that Satan casts in our direction. We can run and not be weary. We can walk and not faint. God wants you and God wants me to be an overcomer. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe I'm in training for heaven right now. And if I understand in my mind and in my heart, in my intellect and in my emotions, that praise is going to be the highest occupation in heaven, maybe I will begin practicing more now so that when I get to the other side, I will not feel out of place. I read from Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And I beheld... And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Verse 12, saying with what kind of voice? Wow. One more time, what kind of voice? Wow. One more time, what kind of voice? Wow. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Same book, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Don't you want to be a part of that much people in heaven? I can hardly wait to get to the other side. And I want you to notice what we're going to be singing and saying and shouting when we get to the other side. Look at it. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Have you heard that word already this, during this camp meeting? Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Amen. My brothers and sisters, surely... Surely that which is going to occupy both the energy and the eternity of heaven must be a fitting example for you and for me to begin practicing down on planet earth as we anticipate inheriting the majesty of that better country. I've been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian now for a number of years, and every now and then someone will still come up to me and ask me the question, are you still Pentecostal? <laughs> and I'll smile like I have a tendency to do, and I'll respond, yes, I am. Aren't you? <laughs> Praising God is not Pentecostal. Amen. Praising God is not Baptist. Praising God is not Seventh-day Adventist. Praising God is Christian. And of all the Christians on the first face of the earth, Seventh-day Adventists ought to be leading the way. In fact, I really believe, I'm convicted in my intellect and I'm convinced in my emotions that if 70 Adventists had been praising God as we should have and could have, we might see a lot more done for the kingdom of God than what we have seen. Now, the Bible gives a number of illustrations of the value of praise. And I want to share one with you from the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. As 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is beginning, the Bible says that the armies of Ammon and Moab have come out against God's people. 
When King Jehoshaphat received word about the enemy that had come against him and the Lord's children, verse 3 says that he reacted very naturally. Notice, and Jehoshaphat feared. However, King Jehoshaphat did not allow that negative agent of fear to linger in his mind and in his heart. But rather, he turned that negative agent of fear into a positive agent for the glory of God as he summoned God's people to a season of prayer and praise. Question, how do you act and how do you react when the devil throws you a negative lemon? You know what most of us do? Most of us make sour-looking faces. But I have discovered there are at least two good things to do with a lemon. I make lemonade or lemon pie. <laughs> because how you and I act and react to the lemon Satan casts in our direction is going to determine how much victory we have in our own lives and how effective our testimony is to others. I mean, who do we think we're going to influence for the kingdom of God if we're always walking around with a sour-looking disposition on our countenance? This world is looking for joy. And you and I have something that we can share with them because the joy of the Lord is our what? The joy of the Lord is our strength. And as we exude in God's joy, it can make an impact on the lives of others. And so, with the people of the kingdom gathered round about, King Jehoshaphat led out in a national season of prayer and praise. And what a season it was. And to me, one of the greatest and yet humblest statements ever uttered by human lips is recorded in verse number 12. Look at it with me. The king is praying. And he says, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. Now, let me stop there and ask a question. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you just did not know what to do? As we say in Georgia, where I was born and raised, you felt as though you were between a rock and a hard place. Have you ever felt like that? But I want you to notice where his attention turned. He said, God, even though the army is great that's come out against us, and even though we do not know what to do, we're not going to focus on the enemy. Look at it. Our eyes are where? Our eyes are upon thee. Not on the circumstances, not on the environment, but he was turning his attention toward God. Now, the Bible doesn't reveal how long they waited for an answer to that prayer. But I personally do not believe they waited too long. And God sent a messenger with a message of hope. Let's continue reading in verse 15. This is what the messenger said. Hearken, you all members of the Christian church, and you inhabitants of the Arizona Conference, and thou, President Ed Keyes. Isn't that what your Bible says? That's exactly what my King James Version of the Bible says. You see, God's message of hope has not changed. And God's saying to the church today the same thing God said to his people years ago. And God's saying to leaders today the same thing he said to leaders in days past. So what was and is the message of hope? Hearken you all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, underscore these next words, be not afraid. Now how had the king acted and reacted in verse 3? He feared. And so a part of the message of hope then and, and the message of hope today is don't be afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude for the battle is not yours but God's. 
And then without taking a breath, the messenger continued in verse 16, go tomorrow down against them. Now, let me stop there just a moment. I know myself pretty well. And if I had been standing there listening to that message, about that time, I would have thrown up both of my hands and shouted at the top of my lungs, wait just a minute. You just told me that the battle is not mine, the battle is God's. So if the battle is God's and not mine, why can't I sleep in late tomorrow? If the battle is God's and not mine, why can't I skip breakfast and just get up in time for brunch? In fact, if the battle is God's and not mine, why do I even need to bother to get out of bread, bed? Well, a very important reason, and the reason is this. God knows the strategy of the enemy even before the enemy thinks it up. May I repeat that? God knows the strategy of the enemy even before the enemy thinks it up. My brothers and sisters, do you understand in your mind and in your heart that the devil can't pull anything over on God? <laughs> God knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. And so, the prophet continues, tomorrow go you down against him, behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziaz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Before the generals ever map out their strategy, God already knew their tactics. <laughs> the enemy can't pull anything over on God. He continued in verse number 17. Don't worry. Every time I read this verse, I think about the little song we used to sing, don't worry, be happy. You remember that? <laughs> don't worry, be happy. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Here it is again, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against him, for the Lord will be with you. <laughs> Anybody else want to say hallelujah with me about now? <laughs> and God's saying the same thing to us today. God will be with us. Now, how did the king and how did the people act and react to that message of hope? Verse 18, and Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Verse 19, and the Levites of the children of the Korathites and the children of the Korhites stood up. And what did they stand up to do? Praise. They stood up, underscore it, to praise the Lord God of Israel with a whisper. Wow, your Bible reads just like mine. They stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. There are some people who get a little upset with Pastor Dan because I have a tendency to get louder and louder and louder. But if you will pardon my English, you ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> Because the closer I come to the, the, the coming of Jesus Christ, the louder I want to become. In fact, I am told that the last cry is to go forth how? As a loud cry. I love you. Am I smiling? Can you still see my teeth? I love you. You are special to the Lord. And you're special to me. But one of the things that really concerned me when my wife and I became Seventh-day Adventist Christians is how quiet Seventh-day Adventists can be. I mean, we can get all excited about a ball game. We can get all excited about a movie. We're still smiling. And yet we can't get excited about our relationship with the Lord. Well, 
you have come too late to tell me I can't praise God with a loud voice. Because my Bible says in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that it's all right to praise God with a loud voice on high. But Pastor Dan, really, does, does this have any merit? Does it have any value to it? Well, let's continue reading in verse 20. And they rose early in the morning. Now, let me stop there and ask you a question. Did God tell them to get up early? No. He just said tomorrow. But they had spent time in prayer. They had spent time in praising God, and they could not hardly wait to see what God was going to do. <laughs> and so they got up early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall you prosper. Sounds like being an overcomer, doesn't it? Verse 21, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And I can just imagine in my sanctified speculation, as the generals of those foreign armies and those soldiers were looking down upon those children of God that were coming against them, they must have thought, they are stupid. Look at them. They're singing. Don't they realize they're marching to their death? They don't have many swords. They don't have many shields. They don't have many spears. They're just singing. And I want you to notice what they were singing. The, the, the song they sang only had one stanza. And it went like this. Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. My brothers and sisters, those foreign generals and armies were in for a rude awakening. Now question, before I read verse 22. Could God have won the victory for his people before they got there? God could have, couldn't he? But I want you to notice in verse number 22, when they experienced victory. Look at it. Underscore these next words. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, he set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which will come against Judah, and they were smitten. So when did they receive victory? When they started singing and praising the Lord. My brothers and sisters, if you and I want more victory in our lives, we need to sing like we have never sung before. If we want more victory in our lives, we need to praise God like we have never praised God before. Because when we erupt in praise, God can do things for us like we have never thought possible. They overcame, and so can you and I. Let me ask you a question. Where does God live? We know he lives in heaven, don't we? But in his relationship with us, where does God live? In Psalm 22, look at verses 1 and 2. David is crying out and he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Do you recognize those words? Jesus asked the same question, did he? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou far from helping me and, and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Have you ever felt like that? 
David was discouraged. And yet in the midst of all of that discouragement, notice in verse 3 where his attention turned. He said, but, despite this, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest. Now, what does inhabit mean? To live, to dwell. So, where does God live? Look at it. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Is there anyone here who has enough of God's presence in your life? We don't, do we? The more you and I praise God, the more it opens us up for his presence to fill us and to thrill us. I've asked myself many times, and this is not being critical or judgmental, why is it? Why is it, why is it that some of my brothers and sisters in the Christian church, yea, even in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian church, find it so difficult to praise the Lord? And I become convicted in my intellect, and I become convinced in my emotions that one of the reasons is some of us have not become convicted and convinced that it's part of God's will so that we might be overcomers. Now, I hope I never tell you anything I can't back up with God's Word. So, having made that observation, I take us to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 and 20. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then he starts going through various aspects of God's will. Now, drop down to verse number 20. A part of God's will is giving what? Giving thanks how often? Giving thanks how often for what? Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I will be the first one to admit that to live this kind of life is not easy. Because the natural way for mankind to act and react, the fleshly way for us to, to enter into relations with God and one another sometimes is to complain when circumstances are not producing roses and the environment has an obnoxious odor. Can anyone quote to me, don't turn in your Bibles, but can anyone quote to me Philippians 2.14? Can anyone quote it? Philippians 2.14, listen very carefully. Do how much? Do all things without what? One more time, what? One more time, what? Do all things without murmuring and disputings. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is only possible as we practice Ephesians 5.20, because it is impossible to give thanks always for all things and murmur at the same time. You just cannot do it. So, I'm still smiling. If you have trouble with murmuring, I've got the remedy for you. Start praising God and giving thanks for all things. You don't have to turn there in your Bibles, but do you remember the experience of Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail? It's in Acts chapter 16. Let me, let me refresh our memory. Paul and Silas have been thrown in jail because of their testimony, their witness for the Lord. They're in that small prison cell Shackles on their ankles, maybe chains on their wrists. And as they're there in that dismal situation, Paul looks over at Silas and he says, Silas, these chains sure are tight on my wrist. And Silas looks at Paul and says, yeah, Paul, did you hear that fellow in the cell next to us snoring last night? I didn't get a wink of sleep. And, 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 and yeah, Silas continues, Paul, the food they're feeding us in this place, 
I mean, it's not fit for the dogs. Is that what they were doing? <laughs> not on your life. While they were incarcerated in that prison cell with shackles on their feet and chains around their wrist, while the man in the cell next to him, them were snoring and their ranched food was on the plates before them, they just started singing and praising God. And it made Father God so happy, he just stretched down his long arm, shook open that prison cell, a Philippian jail in his household were baptized, and God received glory and honor and praise. Several years ago, I was having problems with my eyesight. And I thought I knew what was wrong, but I went to the optometrist just to make sure, and he diagnosed I needed bifocals. Well, a few days later, I went back to have the glasses fitted, and I was sitting at the little table, and the lady, young lady across from me was fitting the glasses to my face, and, and there the devil was. And he said, fella, look at yourself in the mirror. You are now over 40 years of age. You are over the hill. Not only are you over the hill, now you're wearing bifocals. And about that time, I had all I could take, and I just let out one of my hallelujahs. <laughs> and the young lady kind of startled back, and she said, why did you say that? And I responded to her, well, I was sitting here about to start complaining about wearing bifocals, and all of a sudden, it dawned on me it could be worse. I could be blind. I shared that several months later in a revival series, and, and there was an elderly lady came up to me after the service, and she had a big grin on her face, and she said, Pastor Dan, don't ever say anything against trifocals. Don't ever say anything against trifocals. Don't ever say anything against trifocals or going blind, because it could be a lot worse. I was driving alone one day, minding my own business. I looked up and read the sign. Turning gray's not bad, ask any bald headed man. <laughs> but if you and I are always murmuring and complaining about wearing bifocals and trifocals and going blind, if we're always murmuring and complaining about going gray and turning bald, who do we think we're going to influence for the kingdom of God? So what if we go blind? So what if it all falls out? One day, by God's grace, we're going to have a new body. Amen. <laughs> And now's not the time to murmur and complain. Now's the time to start praising God for all things because the best is yet to come. How many of you want to make God happy? I think I see every hand going up. Let me give you the remedy for making God happy. It's found in Hebrews chapter 13. Look at verse 15. Hebrews 13 verse 15. <laughs> And by him, speaking of Jesus Christ, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God. How often? One more time. How often? One more time. How often? Continually. Now, look at me. Okay, everybody look at me. Two wings. Wing of prayer. How often are we to be praying? Pray without ceasing, right? Wing of praise, how often are we to be praising? Continually. If you and I are going to be overcomers, we need these two wings of prayer and praise. Let's continue reading. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the first fruits of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now, follow me very closely here. It is possible to praise God in silence, but every now and then, you and I are to break out and voice with our lips our praise for God, the fruit of our lips. I get asked quite often, Pastor Dan, why do you praise God like you do? And I praise God for, for many reasons, but because of the time factor, let me just share two reasons why I praise God like I do. Not because I was born and raised in a Pentecostal church. 
Not because I went to Baptist seminary. Not because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Let me share with you two reasons why I praise God like I do. Number one, I do not believe that Satan can read my mind and heart. In fact, sometimes I wonder what's going on there, okay? <laughs> do you understand, my friends, that the only way Satan knows what's going on in your mind and heart is as you tell him with your lips or you show him with your body language? Let me illustrate it like this. You're in church, and someone comes up to you, and they're wanting to tell you something really important. And as they're sharing with you, you are doing this number here. Is that showing concern or unconcern? Let's say your pastor is preaching one of his powerful, dynamic sermons one Sabbath morning, and you're doing this number here. <laughs> showing interest or non-interest? You see, the only way the devil knows what's going on in our mind and heart is as we show him with our body language or tell him with our lips. And every now and then, after he has shot those fiery darts in my direction, and I can take it no longer, I have a little, little ritual I go through. I get in my car. I drive to the closest interstate highway or country road, and I get my car going just as fast as it will go. That's safe and legal. <laughs> I roll down the window. And I start singing as loud as I can. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. And then I say, devil, how do you like that? Sometimes Satan needs to hear from the fruit of our lips that we love God. Amen. Second reason why I praise God out loud like I do, I have discovered that by and large the language of our generation is condemnation. I mean, our little children can cut one another down so fast. Pew, pew, pew. We have taught them well. Condemnation is the language of our generation. And it's so easy for us to fall into the trap of using condemnatory words as we communicate with one another. It's an easy trap to fall into. Several years ago, I'd fallen into the trap of calling people turkey, especially if they said something I didn't agree with. One day I was talking with a fellow pastor and he said something I really didn't agree with. And I said, you turkey you, don't you know it ought to be such and such a way? And he got right up in my face about this close to my nose and he went gobble, gobble, gobble. <laughs> <laughs> and it dawned on me what I was doing. I mean, that man wasn't a turkey. A turkey is a dumb, illiterate bird. And so every now and then, you and I ought to just break out praising God so that the devil might be reminded and the world might come to an understanding that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but Jesus came to redeem the world. <laughs> and if Jesus does not condemn, I have no right to condemn either. Hmm. Now, what I'm about to say Pastor Keys, I'm not going to charge the Arizona Conference for what I'm about to say. This is a freebie, okay? <laughs> it is all right to praise God out loud in church. Amen. When Brother Scott sings one of his anointed songs, you ought to say, amen. amen. When your pastor preaches one of his powerful, dynamic sermons, 
you ought to let out a praise the Lord every now and then. When someone excites your spirit in Christ, you ought to just break out in a hallelujah every now and then. Don't. I have people come. I'm still smiling. I have people come to me sometimes and, and they ask the question, why is it, Pastor Dan, that, that people come to our Seventh-day Adventist churches and, 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 and they don't come back? Well, there are a number of reasons why, but let me tell you one of the reasons why. One of the reasons why is that when some people come to some of our Seventh-day Adventist churches, it's almost like attending a funeral. Amen or ouch. It is all right to praise God out loud in church as long as it's done decently and in order. Now, I asked the question earlier, how many of you want to make God happy? Look at verse number 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, underscore it, God is how? God is well pleased. So I believe that every time you and I praise God, Heavenly Father looks over at Jesus, and Jesus looks over at Heavenly Father, and they just smile real big. Makes God happy, well pleased when we praise Him as we should and could. In conclusion, how many of you are alive? Okay, there are some of you in doubt. <laughs> that was not a trick question, okay? Let me reassure you, if you're breathing, you are alive, okay? Okay? Now, it may, that's what, it may not be the quality of life that you want, okay? Some of you may be going through struggles. Some of you may be going through pain and heartache. But you have life, okay? Psalm 150, <laughs> the last verse. Psalm 150, verse number six. But everything that hath breath, are you alive? Amen. Are you breathing? Amen. Let everything that hath breath do what? Praise, Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So if you and I are breathing, we should be praising God. I heard the story several years ago about a young teenage girl. She had just gotten her driver's license and she picked up some of her young friends to take them to a church function. They had a great time of fun and, and fellowship festivities. After everything was over, they got into the car and she started toward their various homes. She came to an intersection. She had the right of way. She started to go through. There was a car came from the opposite direction, plowed into the side of that automobile loaded with young people. And they were all killed, except the young girl who was driving. She spent months in the hospital. Finally, the doctors called her parents and said, take her home. There's nothing we can do for her. There is no physical reason why she's paralyzed from her waist down. It's all in her mind. It's all in her heart. She's blaming herself for the death of her young friends. There's nothing we can do. Take her home. A few days after the parents took their daughter home, there was an elderly lady from down the street, came to visit with her, and she had a pleasant visit. And as she was getting ready to leave, she asked, Sweetheart, is there any part of your legs or feet that you can move at all? And the young girl asked her to remove the comforter, and she pointed down to her right foot. And just barely detectable was there a little movement in one toe. The elderly lady leaned down and, and gave her a hug and said, Sweetheart, that's fantastic. Would you do yourself a favor? Every time you think about it, would you praise God for movement in that one toe? 
And the young girl said she would. A few days later, the elderly lady came back and had another pleasant visit. And as she was getting ready to leave, she asked, sweetheart, how's it going? The young girl asked her to remove the comforter and she pointed down to her right foot and now there was movement in all five of those toes. And she leaned down and gave the young girl a hug and said, sweetheart, that's fantastic. Would you do yourself a favor? Every time you think about it, would you praise God for movement in your five toes? The young girl said she would. In just a few weeks, That elderly lady knew the thrill of placing a frail arm around strong shoulders and the joy of a strong arm around her frail shoulders as together they took the very first step toward complete recovery. Today, that young girl not only walks, she runs for the glory of God. (laughs) And it all started with praising the Lord for movement, just a little movement, in one toe. Brother Ed, everywhere I travel, I'm seeing toes start to move. They're moving. And I believe that soon and very soon we are going to become an overcoming force for the cause of heaven. And soon and very soon, there's going to be a conversation in heaven that's going to take place like this. As Heavenly Father looks over at God the Son, and he says, Son, listen to my children. Son, can you hear my children? Son, my children, they've learned how to praise. Son, my children are ready to come home. (laughs) Son, go get my children, and Jesus is going to be on the way. And when he comes in the clouds of glory, and you and I, if we're alive, we're going to rise to meet him. If we're in the graves, we're going to ascend, and we're going to form a great company. And we're going to chorus together. Lo, this is our God, and we have waited for him. And you talk about shouting when we get to the other side. Oh, there's going to be shouting, as the old song says, on the heels of glory. And when you get there, and I get there by the grace and power of God, you can find me real easy because I'm going to be on the corner of Amen and Hallelujah Boulevard. (laughs) Will you meet me there? I'm going to be looking for you on the other side, and we are going to sing to the glory of God because we have been overcomers through the blood of the Lamb. Amen. 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 Father God, oh, Lord, I thank you so very much for this awesome privilege I've had to share these very simple messages with these, your children and my spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, I ask that the words that I have shared have found a resting place, that they will bring forth fruit and more fruit and much fruit for the glory of your kingdom. Enable us to finish our course with victory and enter into eternity with the blood of the Lamb covering our souls so that we can shout forevermore. Jesus paid it all, and Jesus is worthy of all glory, honor, and power. Because I pray this prayer and give you praises in Christ's name, and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Fixed my mind on another time, on another time, and 
Here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And that is today, today, today until. On another time, on another time, and I have set my course on the narrow way, on the narrow way, for I know. On the narrow way, on the narrow way, even so, Lord, come quickly, this is my fervent prayer, for I've caught a glimpse of glory. God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now may the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the communion of the sweet Holy Spirit 
Keep us close to heaven and one another so that we might be overcomers for the cause of Christ. We pray in his name, amen. Pastor Dan, uh, we really appreciate your message and Scott, your message and music. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation tonight. Once again, I'd like to thank each one uh, who's tuned in on Good News TV. We're thankful for the crew that's put this together. Now, this is a little different than our normal camp meeting. I would be introducing or announcing tomorrow morning at 6.45 a.m. the meeting that we're having, but because it's virtual camp meeting, we're taking a few days off. Off. Uh, we'll have Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday off, and we'll start again Wednesday night at 7 is our next presentation with uh, Ted Huskins uh, from the New England area. He's going to be sharing with us at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. We look forward to each of you joining us again uh, by Good News TV, or if you're here in the local area and you figure out where we're meeting, you can come join us. God bless you all. Have a wonderful evening. And thank you again, Pastor Dan and Scott Michael, for your beautiful, beautiful presentations. God bless you. Hi, I'm Luke Skelton, General Manager for Good News TV. It has been our honor to bring the virtual camp meeting experience to you via live stream on our website, Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. If you would like to obtain any DVDs of the powerful messages you have seen, or if you have any questions about camp meeting, please give us a call. It is the mission of Good News TV to spread the love of Jesus Christ and the truths of his word, as well as connecting viewers with a local church family. We broadcast Christ-centered messages of hope 24 hours a day on seven TV stations throughout Arizona in both English and Spanish. Please help us with our mission by giving generously to this ministry. To donate, please visit our website at mygoodnewstv.com or give us a call at 480-264-1116. Thank you for your participation in this year's virtual camp meeting, and thank you for your prayers and support of this media outreach ministry. God bless you. In 1946, God decided he was going to call somebody into the ministry. So he thought, well, let's go to Washington State and uh, take a look at Seattle and uh, see what we can find. And uh, he decided he was going to choose the most unlikely prospect for the ministry. And so he looked around and he saw this short kid of 10 years old in Ballard, uh, this part of Seattle. And he said, perfect. God sent his Holy Spirit and directed me, that's Ed, to go to a Bible club on the same street. The leader gave to me a brand new leather Holman Bible. I remember that, it was such a beautiful Bible. I took it home and I cherished that Bible and I began to read. I devoured that book. And you know, the more I read the Word of God, it quickened my mind and it got into my heart and my spirit. And I began to teach others as um, the Lord blessed me. And then after graduating from Ballard High School in Seattle, I went to Northwest College and there I studied for the ministry. Between my junior and senior year, I married Olga. She was the daughter of the people who had the children's Bible club that I got, uh, became a Christian in. In 1959, I graduated from Northwest College and 
Then I started my ministry with the Native Americans. Um, I received an appointment, a national appointed home missionary to the American Indians. 10 days after leaving my last church was an Indian church in the city of Seattle. 10 days later, my wife Olga suddenly died from a massive brain hemorrhage. And it was really a shock to me. But you know, during those lonely hours, I felt the presence of God. He's there when you need him. And I just thank him for his presence. And then later on, God uh, led me to a dear friend that I'd known for about 40 years. And we were married, her name was Jan. We moved to Arizona and we attended uh, First Assembly of God Church in Apache Junction. Then in 2009, television went from analog to digital. So we bought a converter box and we decided, well, we'll uh, reprogram it. And, um, and an interesting station came up called Good News TV. And we were really attracted to it because we were into uh, health, healthy lifestyle and also cooking. And so we, we really loved the program. And so th we began to listen to the highly intelligent, intellectual guest speakers. And we just were really uh, at first a little upset because they taught differently than, than I had been taught. Where are the dead now? It says he remains in the tomb, and when Jesus comes, they're in the graves. If that's clear, let me hear you say amen. Well, that's interesting. Come on, preacher. What about the thief on the cross? But the more I realized they were backing up everything they said by the scripture, I realized um, there's really something to it. We, we really enjoyed the programming so much we decided we wanted to support it. After watching uh, the different programming, I began to change my thoughts about the Sabbath and about the state of the dead and about the second coming of Christ. And there were many other doctrines that uh, that really um, arrested us and we liked it. And in the Yellow Pages, I found Mesa Palm Seventh-day Adventist Church. We were warmly welcomed. You know, greeters are so important. Um, I had requested to see the pastor. He called up and came over to see me, expecting to see a Seventh-day Adventist retired pastor. And it blew his mind to find out I was an Assembly of God uh, pastor. He spent two and a half hours with us and we fell in love with this man of God. He was so warm and special. The next Sabbath we went back to the church and I asked him first thing for a book of doctrine because doctrine has always been important and Following God's word to me is the primary thing. If it's in God's word, I'm going to accept it. If it's not, I just throw it out. And so I took the book of doctrines and it was uh, entitled, What Seventh-day Adventists Believe. And I brought it home. I read it through in that week. And I thought, wow, really makes sense. And I have since read the book through two more times, and each time I realize it makes a lot of sense. It's really scriptural. Pastor Darnell was really brave, and he even let me preach in his church not too long later. I, but I did have a struggle about my credentials, and um, it took me several months of, of debating and what to do, and. Finally, Jan said, you're nothing but a mugwump. And I said, what's a mugwump? 
And she said, well, that's a political term of a bird sitting on a fence with his mug on one side and his wump on the other. And uh, she says, you're gonna have to make up your mind. And I decided, well, I don't wanna be a mug wump. And so I realized at that point, I was no good to the Assemblies of God because I no longer believed the way they believed. Well, you know, the day that I took and mailed my resignation to the Assemblies of God, I walked out the driveway and put it in our mailbox by the street. And when I did that, as I walked back, I just felt so light and happy. It was like a weight had been lifted off my back. I was so certain that I had done the right thing. And of course, I do love the Assemblies of God. And you know, they, they love me even yet and, and allow me to speak even in their churches and uh, some of the Indian camp meetings when I go to Washington State. In uh, 2012, Jan passed away. I decided I was going to remain single and um, just uh, preach and, and um, do whatever the Lord would lead me to do. And then God brought to me the most wonderful, beautiful wife. I can't believe it. So I asked her if she would marry me and it took her about a half a second to say yes. And so then we got married on June the 7th, 2014. Now we are able to um, give our, our life to the Lord and um, we still minister in churches. Uh, Sheila sings beautifully and I preach. And um, I just praise God for Good News TV because Good News TV has changed my life. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Hamilton Williams, and I'm the pastor of the Phoenix Beacon Light Church, situated on 2602 North 51st Avenue in Phoenix. You know, as I've studied the Word of God, I've come to realize that one of the great gifts that God has given to us is the freedom of choice. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19, he says, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Please choose life. This is so pivotal with God that he himself doesn't go against it. He says, I offer you life and death, yet he is so loving. He doesn't say, just take it or leave it. He says, please choose life. We would like to welcome you at the Beacon Light Services on a Saturday at 9.30 a.m. and then at 11 a.m. Please come join us as we reach out for life. Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus die? And is Jesus really God? The book, The Desire of Ages, is the life story of the greatest spiritual leader the world has ever known, Jesus Christ. By the simple short record of three and a half years, he changed the world more profoundly than any other. The accounts in the four gospels are interwoven in this over 100-year-old classic. The Desire of Ages does not merely set down a series of remote events. It presents the meaning of them so vividly that you will feel like you are an eyewitness to what is being described. Here are captured and answered the tensions between hope and despair, shame and acceptance, the past and the future, false and true religion, and desire and fulfillment. The Desire of Ages is a free resource. Call Good News TV at 480-264-1116 for your free copy. It's time again for Arizona Camp Meeting. This is a time every year to come away for spiritual renewal, to enjoy fellowship and powerful Christ-centered messages of encouragement and hope. 
In past years, Good News TV has brought our viewers the camp meeting experience live from Camp Yava Pines in Prescott, Arizona. This year, however, we are doing things a bit differently, which we hope will make it easier for you and your family to participate and be part of the blessing. Instead of coming up to Prescott, you can come in person to a local church near you that is downlinking our virtual camp meeting. Although we're not broadcasting the messages live on TV, you can watch on the live stream at our Good News TV website or our YouTube channel. But since fellowship is an important part of camp meeting for the whole family, we encourage you to come in person and experience it together with fellow believers. Anyone is invited to this free event. Visit our website or call us at Good News TV for a list of times and locations, some of which will also provide children's programs on site. Thank you for your prayers and your support of Good News TV as we reach Arizona for Jesus. My name is Bill Johnson. I'm 88 years old. I'm sorry to say my wife passed away approximately eight years ago. And I never was much of a TV watcher, so I have an uh, a antenna on my TV. That's the only TV I have now. I've had, for years, I've had uh, uh, satellite TV and so forth. My wife watched it all the time. I've been blessed to be able to watch uh, uh, Amazing Facts, uh, 3ABN, uh, on Good News TV just with just my antenna. And I ran, came across uh, uh, Doug Batchelor on uh, Amazing Facts TV. I got to watching him a whole lot and uh, became rather interested in what he has to, had to say. And then uh, I became a little more familiar with the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, through his uh, teachings and uh, preachings on uh, TV. and. Uh, I was, I was quite impressed with the fact that everything that he said or everything that the Seventh-day Adventist Church stands for is, comes right out of the Bible. It's all backed up by the Bible and everything, including the Sabbath, which most people don't honor at all, is biblical. And uh, that's what really brought me uh, into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, I've, I've got to say that this, the, the minute I walked in the door, in fact, before I walked in the door, I met a young lady out in front who was a greeter, and uh, she's become a very close and dear friend of mine, she and her husband. And uh, I walked in the doors of this church, and as soon as I walked into the foyer, I just felt right at home. Something just came over me where I just, I just felt this is where I belong. And so I've been attending this church ever since. I, I, I was baptized in a, a, a Protestant church probably uh, two to three years ago. Uh, and uh, after I came to the Yuma Central uh, pastor here, asked me if I would consider being baptized again. And I, I was also baptized uh, uh, after, after I started attending this church. I've, I've been blessed to uh, be able to watch uh, Amazing Facts TV, 3ABN, on Good News TV with my TV antenna. And uh, that, that is, uh, their, their programming is absolutely wonderful. There's so many uh, different uh, uh, speakers on there, pastors and one thing or another that are just absolutely out of this world. Then every one of them is just absolutely excellent. Hi. My name is Jeff Rogers and I'm the principal at Thunderbird Adventist Academy on this lush green campus that you see behind me here in Scottsdale, Arizona. 
I want to talk to you for a quick minute about our program, a program that has a dual purpose, to train students for college and for life on this earth, but also to introduce them to Jesus Christ as a friend. I work with some amazing teachers who are dedicated to not just education, but also to introducing these students to God. Whether it's through our ski vespers or through our mission trips, we provide creative approaches to introducing students to God. If you'd like more information about Thunderbird Adventist Academy, please contact Good News TV and come experience life here at TAA. Thank you.